This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames are back at 500 after an interesting up and down week. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're back to talk about Flames hockey. So, Matt, the Flames got out of this week with not too bad of a record. They, uh, they're they sitting at 500 again. What are you thinking about the team right now? It's a frustrating team, frankly. It, they have all the talent in the world. It's just outside of Gaudreau and Monaghan, nobody up front is doing anything well. And that's kind of ruining everything else and you can even see that evidenced by the game winning goals for the flames this season they've scored six game winners and four of them are sean monahan you know this seems to be the conversation we've had for the last couple years one year it's oh everybody's working hard except for goudreau monahan then the next it's nobody's working hard except for goudreau and monahan well, if we get everybody on the same page, we'll either be spectacularly terrible or spectacularly awesome. <laughs> the same page at the same time. Yeah. Well, one good thing is, for the first time in his career, nobody's complaining about Sean Monahan's slow start to the season. That's true. We got other guys who are having a worse start. Yeah, which is basically everybody that's not number 13 or 23. And hey, you know, it's not as bad as Iggy. At least some of these guys will probably get going before Christmas. True. Well, Matt, let's look back at this past week. The Flames played four games since we talked last, two on the road, two at home. They started on the road against the Nashville Predators. This was a game that I thought was going to be quite a good game, and it, I thought, yeah, it was okay. In the first period, I don't know about you, but I've never seen so many line changes or strategic changes in the first minute of a game or the first three minutes of a game before. Like, it seemed like every 10 seconds they were changing lines. Yeah, it was trying to mess with the other team, trying to get the matchups they wanted, and it was a little weird, but, you know, they, it, you're playing the defending Western Conference champions, so... It, You know, you got to do something to switch things up. And then, as usual, we couldn't stay out of the box, and it cost two early goals against the Flames here. This is the one thing we've talked about for years. This team needs to stay out of the box. I don't know what we have to do. Maybe shock callers or something. So if you, you know, do something wrong, we shock the player. But we got to stay out of the box. It's costing the Flames every game. Uh, Excise the demons of Dennis Weidman. Have a, you know, have Jobu you know give him special favors during the pregame skate i don't know tomorrow's halloween maybe they can do some sort of uh exorcism yeah i thought in the second period of this game the flames started doing a whole lot of things right it seemed like the whole machine just started to come alive and they really started to play and i thought this was a great period of hockey but they had a hot goalie in that and i think that was a big reason why the flames really struggled here and then in the third they got rewarded for their hard work all game they kept playing a great game, and that's why the Flames ended up tying it up. Yeah, and through the four games, the Flames played consistently better than they had in the first ten games of the season. Or first eight games, I should say. And where it's you're seeing more of a 60-minute effort, not playing well until they score and then stop playing. It's just... Well, this game especially, I thought that in terms of five-on-five play, the Flames were the better team. Yeah, and other than the two penalties that caused the first two goals for Nashville, Calgary was basically flawless the rest of the game, and even before the penalties, they were playing well up until that point. So even in the, the subsequent games, it was mostly the penalty kill that sunk the team more than anything else yeah and i think in this one too the flames i don't know i thought this could be the turning point the flames ended up coming back when they stayed out of the box they did well 
They played a great five on five. I thought this could really be that turning point that the Flames need. Then the next night they rolled into St. Louis. I always want to say the Keel Center, but I think it's the Scott Trade Center now or something. Um, we saw Eddie Lack get his first start as a Calgary Flame during the regular season, but Eddie Lack didn't have a great night as the Calgary Flames lost 5-2 to two to the St. Louis Blues. I don't know about you, Matt. I was excited at the beginning. I thought the Flames dominated the first period right up until the Alex Steen goal, and after that I thought that things just kind of got away from them. Yeah, as soon as Steen scored, the team just quit playing, and for most of the second period as well, and... Uh, they got back on their horse, but then Stastny scored to make it 4-2, and uh, that was just too little too late. They got they got going. Steen scored. They kind of got the wind knocked out of their sails, and again, they got into penalty trouble, and it cost them. I thought that they really came in with some good momentum about halfway through the third, but at that point, it was too little too late. When you're playing an elite team like the Blues, yeah. As long as you're not getting embarrassed by the team, even if you lose, that's okay. And, like, I didn't think that the Flames got embarrassed in the game. I thought they were the better team, and most nights the Flames probably would win that game. It's just a combination. They lost the special teams battle. Yeah, and Eddie Lack let in two goals that he probably wouldn't have, you know, Mike Smith wouldn't have, and but that too is you know not much you can do because you have to play the backup sometimes well let's talk about that eddie lack very different goaltender very different style than mike smith one thing i noticed in this game is he plays really deep in his net which was kind of weird to watch what are your overall thoughts on lack well that was what the carolina goalie coach was trying to change in his game and getting him to not play so deep in his net but it made Black significantly worse because of the fact that he loses his net rather easily. And I think that's part of the reason why Lack plays so deep is that he does lose the net quite a bit. And on two of the goals that he surrendered, he the Blues had a wide open area to shoot at. And Yeah, the, I think the, if you the, want Eddie Lack to be your goalie, you kind of have to go with that. That's part of who he is as a goaltender yeah and he'll be fine as a backup like it, i wouldn't expect him to be amazing by any me measure but it is what it is and as long as he can play 500 hockey that's basically all the flames need from him and if he continues to struggle then we have gillies on the farm so it's not the end of the world one way or the other and it's not like he's going to be playing more than like once every 10 games you could tell in this game that the defensemen were very used to having mike smith there's a lot of times when it looked like the defense were waiting for the puck to be played looked back realized oh it's not smith and then they had to go and do a bit more work than they were used to so that's going to take some adjustment when lack is in net as well just because of the two very different styles and lack is not a goaltender we want stick handling very much no no, and frankly, there's only maybe five goalies in the NHL that you would want to stick handle anywhere near the amount that Smith does. But when you get used to it, it's tough to break that habit. True. On uh, Friday night, the Calgary Flames came back to the Saddle Dome to start a seven-game homestand against the Dallas Stars, a team that I've always thought we've had some entertaining games against in the past, and the Flames lost this one, 2-1 to one, to Dallas. This one, to me, was uh, the story of this one was the refing and the penalty calls. I thought that the officiating was pretty questionable in this game. Yeah, that penalty on Hamannick. That was one of the worst calls I've ever seen. A player getting decked from behind, and he just taps the skate of the other player, and he gets the penalty. It, it, you know, it's... Like, yeah, it, it was a penalty, if you're, you know, because you're calling the retaliation. But that's one of those where they both Faxa and... Hamannick should have went under the worst case scenario or just not call a penalty there. But it, it, the refing has been extremely inconsistent for most teams because I've watched a handful of games for other teams and it seems like every night one team is getting screwed 
for no reason. <laughs> and, like, I was watching the Panthers play the Ducks the other day, and, like, Anaheim kept getting penalties, and it, Florida was the aggressor in most of the most for most of the game, and yet Anaheim kept going to the penalty box. So, just weird overall with the refing, but not much you can do, and that really isn't an excuse. Like, if you're only getting one goal on Kari Lettinen, like, you've got bigger problems than, oh, gee, we had a penalty called against us. I thought that in the beginning of this game, the Flames looked really good. The first seven or eight minutes, the Flames had lots of physicality, they moved the puck out of their zone well, but... As the story is we've talked about, the special teams and a rough third cost the Flames the game. Yep. The other thing I noticed really here is after, I mean, Kulak was in for what? I think both the Nashville and the St. Louis game. Mm-hmm. Um, Bartkowski came back in. And I thought the third defensive pairing struggled really hard in this one. Yeah. I think we're finally we're- starting to see Bartkowski looking like a, a fringe seventh defenseman. And, like, even in the advanced statistics that I don't tend to call on too much, like, it's clear that, like, Barkowski is significantly worse than everybody else, including Kulak. And realistically, the Flames should no longer play Barkowski unless there's an injury. And even then, probably it would be better to go get a kid from the farm. Well, it's so weird because, I mean, I don't know, there seems to be this correlation that last year Bartkowski was signed and the team started winning. And this year when the Flames had their opening day roster, I'd mentioned I thought it was weird Kulak was sitting, but it's almost like because we won when this guy was on the team, even though he didn't really contribute to that winning, we should start him again. And I'd said at the time, Uh, I think it was more Bartkowski who was going to play himself out of position than Kulak who would play himself into a position. And that's exactly what's happened. Yeah, and we've seen that with a number of players on the team. It's not just Barkowski who's playing themselves out of a spot. But no, we'll, but get I th- a, we'll get to that later. Yeah, I think Barkowski is noticeable to me because there's obviously a better guy just sitting in the wings. Yeah. Um, so that, to me, was the big one there. And then I think the best game of the week for, for Flames fans was on Sunday night. Alex Ovechkin and the Washington Capitals came into town. And the Flames ended up winning that one 2-1. to one. Matt, any overall thoughts on this game? Oh, it was an entertaining game from start to finish. Uh, I thought Grubauer for Washington nearly stole them a win. And full props to him. He was good in that game. What is it with the Flames and hot backups this year? That's been the, the story of like the Flames for the last 30 years. It's like, oh, other team's going to put our their backup in. Time for a Vesna caliber performance. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, the Flames are the team you make your name as a backup. Yeah. It's sort of like Jays and like opposition starting pitchers that have never pitched in the majors before. And, like, they'll have, like, a shutout just because it – yeah, it's for whatever reason the backups seem to do really well against Calgary and Grubauer. He's the only reason why that game yesterday wasn't a seven to one game. Yeah, I was really impressed by the Flames. They were pretty much able to keep up with the Capitals. They had the Capitals on their on their feet the whole game, and I think the Flames, which I wasn't expecting, were really dictating the play here. Yeah, and this is more of the type of game that I was expecting from the team from the get go. Where, okay, Washington's one of the best teams in the league. We're better than them. And we're going to control the play, and they have to respond to what we're doing. And that's how it was in the game, where Calgary just dominated the entire game from start to finish. And if it wasn't for the weird puck off the linesman resulting in the Verana goal, that would have been a shutout. And... It was just one of those games where Calgary just simply outclassed the opposition, and it's a good thing that it was a elite team in the league. And that might be the turning point just because of who it was. If that was us beating a crappy team, it might not have the same oh, mental no, like it, yeah, like turnaround we, for these players. Yeah, like if we did that to Arizona, it's like, oh, gee, that was, you know, you know if you didn't do that, there's something wrong. <laughs> I think I was the most happy with the first 40 of this game than I've than I've been all season long. Was that the best 40 minutes of hockey that the Flames played to open this game? 
Yeah, and I have to say that Brett Kulak had his best game as a flame, and if he can keep that up, then uh, there's definitely no way he's getting out of the lineup. That's where I was going to go, too. I think not just this season, but any game he's ever played wearing a flaming C, this was his best game. He looked like a, an NHL defenseman. Mm -hmm. And a decent one, not just a fill-in guy. Yeah, and I think that maybe that pressure's on him with Bartkowski in and out of lineup. This was Kulak's chance to shine, and he did a great job. I, I was really happy with Kulak. Yeah, and plus there's pressure from the farm because both Shillington and Anderson are doing well down in Stockton. And it's one of those situations, like with the forward groups, that if you're not playing well, well, there's good players playing down there, and they can take your spot. So you better put up, or you know we're gonna go elsewhere. Janko looked like he wanted to stay in Calgary in this one too. Yeah, well, Jankowski's been, other than the one game, he's been fairly effective. Period, and. A lot of his struggles was get, having to go up against Hansel's line frequently in the Dallas Stars game. But, you know, it's, yeah. in, it's interesting you mentioned the line matching because if you watch in the Capitals game, the Flames were doing a lot less line matching than they usually do, and I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah, well, that's one of the luxuries of having two top-end defense pairings is that it, if one's not out there against Ovechkin, the other one is. And... Yeah, as long as you're not sending Kulak and Stone out to play Ovechkin, you're pretty much fine. So, And for the first time all week, I'm not going to get angry. The Flames didn't win the special teams battle here, but they didn't lose it either. They were sort of neutral. And when we're not losing the special teams battle, we're able to win a game. Weird yeah. concept, isn't it? Well, that's the thing. Like, It's fine if you're taking penalties if you can kill them off. And like... Before, like, a lot of previous shows, we've been praising Troy Brower specifically for the penalty killing, but then that immediately stopped, basically, as soon as we mentioned it. And it's one of those situations where, like, if you're taking penalties and then promptly giving up goals, well, that's your season right there. And, like, that just simply can't continue. And similarly on the power play, the Flames haven't been scoring very much at all on the power play either so that doubly contributes to the problem you know the other thing i was talking to a friend of mine this week and he was mentioning too you got to look at penalties for and penalties against almost like a plus minus he said for every penalty you give up you ha that same guy has to be able to draw at least one penalty mm -hmm. and you look at a guy like a chuck and he's really good at doing that for every penalty he gives up he's great at drawing a penalty for us you look at a guy like Bennett, he's great at taking penalties, but not drawing penalties. And so for every for every two minutes you give up, you've got to be able to get the team two minutes on the power play. Mm -hmm. I never really thought of it that way. Yeah, well, it's important. Like, you can be an agitator and piss the other team off like Kachuk does. And that's great because it gets them off their game. But if you're all you're doing is creating a problem and a mess for everybody else to clean up that's a bit of a problem and Bennett needs to either become a better agitator or become more disciplined one or the other so with the win over Washington the Flames break a four game losing streak at home they haven't won in the Dome since the Winnipeg home opener and I'm glad they broke that streak because they've got five more in a row at home so hopefully this will set them up on the right path the one troubling thing, though, Matt, is if you look at the Flames, they're in, like, the bottom five of the league for goals scored, which is not where we want to be if we're going to be a playoff team. No, How do we I, fix this? That's At least Monaghan and Gaudreau are doing awesome. And Gaudreau has 15 points in 12 games, one of the league leaders in points. Awesome. Looking better than he did this time last year. Oh, for sure. And now... The main problem is uh, getting the other 10 forwards to do something. So let's and pause right there. Do you think that this team has the right talent on the roster to score? Yeah. I, well, not the fourth line, but everybody else should be doing something. So it's not like we need to go out and blow this thing up. We have the right talent. We just need to get them engaged. Yeah, and you can see flashes from various players, whether it's the 3M line or even Sam Bennett. Uh, 
like there was flashes of ability to do it. It's just the bounces aren't going their way. And it's like everybody's just gripping the sticks a little too hard. And like once somebody gets a really crappy garbage goal, then like the puck's going to be going in left, right, and center. And it, it, we even seen that with Furland where he had struggled for the majority of the season gets an opportunity but struggles again then gets another shot in the same game and a puck goes in on one of his shifts and now I think he's been involved in three or four goals now since then and it's one of those where like I think if any everybody can just start chipping in a little bit like a lot of these problems will go away like the flames doesn't magically go from being one of the better scoring teams to being the worst one of the worst when nothing's really changed about the team it's just it seems like everybody's just mired in a slump all at the same time and that's what the problem is yeah, I'd agree with that. I think this team has the right players. Maybe we need to shuffle the deck a little bit, but I think that once we get going, once one or two guys per line get going, we're going to see a lot more offensive firepower from this team. Mm -hmm. So how do you fix this, Matt? Do we, I mean, do we have to, I don't know, you know, whip the players in a shape? Do we have to change the lines? Do we have to put guys in uncomfortable situations? Maybe, you know, sh shuffling their positions or doing something different? How do you get them out of slump? Well, honestly, I think that he, the Flames might be best to break up the 3M line, even though they're probably the best team line on the team at both ends of the ice. But I think just everybody needs a little bit of a spark around the rink. And, uh, you know, like if you moved Bennett up into Kachuk's spot and maybe move Kachuk with Jankowski and Yager or have Bennett with Jankowski and Yager, I think. All right, so let's uh, break down what these lines might look like then. So on the first line, we'd have Goudreau, Monaghan, and who? Furland, just because he's starting to do good, so you just kind of so let him. that one. Yeah, you just let that one rip until he gets uh, that one goes cold. And then on line two, you're thinking Sam Bennett on the left with Backlund and Froelich? Yeah, it, or Kachuk. Uh, that would be the tough one to break up, but if you're going to do it, swap Bennett in there. And then who do you put with Versteeg and Yager? Well, uh, Versteeg I'd be having on the fourth line or in the press box. Okay. And, and Kachuk with Jankowski and Yager. Or Bennett with Janko and Yager. One and then the what's your fourth line? Ideally, it would Whoever's be... Whoever's left? Ideally, it would be Hathaway... Uh, Lazar and Brower, but we're not in ideal land here. So I'd probably... I think that even for Stieg, Brower, and Lazar wouldn't be a bad fourth line. No, I think that Matt Stajan has to stop playing in the NHL, unfortunately. Uh, it, and it might just be like give him a game off or two or something. It's just he's really declined in terms of his foot speed and he's not an nhl player at the moment i know where you're coming from and i was thinking the same thing watched him this past week but i'm also looking around saying let's just say he was getting paid like a fourth liner let's say he's getting paid a million bucks i think there's a lot worse fourth line centermen out there in the league and i'm not sure that putting someone else on fourth line minutes who do you get that's better Lazar would be an upgrade, I think. And I don't know if I want Lazar at center right now. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, it's tough because the fact that I think like if you put a handful of different people in stage and spot, I think it would be an upgrade overall. It's just. Well, I mean, we've had guys sitting in and out of the lineup. I mean, maybe you put Lazar at center and even bring Freddie Hamilton into the lineup and uh, yeah. stage and sit. Yeah, like, I, honestly, I think at this point, Freddie Hamilton's an upgrade on stage. And so, and I don't even think that Hamilton's a high-end NHL play like NHL regular player either. So it's... Neither's Tanner Glass, but would you bring him in over Stajan? Yeah, I would. 
And maybe that's what Stajan needs. Maybe Stajan needs a little bit of that pressure to say, you know what, Matt, um, you're you know you're declining. We're bringing Freddie in instead of you. Win the job back from Freddie. Almost like what's happened with Kulak and Bartkowski. Yeah, and that's a lot of the problem right now. Like honestly, I think Versteeg hasn't been an NHL caliber player either, and I think that both of them. Like honestly, if it was up to me, I'd have Glass, Lazar, and Brower using the current lineup as the fourth line. Yeah, I don't want to judge for St- I don't want to break up the lines too much till we get Yager back cuz I think we're missing a big piece, but I think that Versteeg and Yager together is really going to produce well going forward. Yeah. I wouldn't want to take Versteeg out without seeing a bit more of him and Yager together. I think if you've got say Versteeg, Stajan and Yager or Versteeg, Bennett and Yager, I think that's going to really produce well. I think the Versteeg as much as he might not have been looking stellar as a bottom six guy, I think he's got... I mean, he's, he's one of the smarter hockey players in that bottom six right now, and I don't want to take that out. I understand. It's just... The Flames need to send some of the bottom-end players a bit of a message to shape up because, frankly, everybody in the bottom six has been horrid to start the year. Like, uh, there's no bones about it. Everybody in the bottom six has been absolutely terrible. But I'd say even even the 3M line hasn't been stellar. They haven't been terrible, but they haven't been stellar. No, but at least the 3M line's playing like an NHL caliber line, and the same can't be said for anybody in the bottom six. See, if it was me, I'd keep the first two lines. I'd keep the Goudreau, Monaghan, Furland, Kachuk, Backlund, and Froelich, and I just essentially shuffle up the bottom two lines, and as you play better, you get more minutes. Yeah. Well, ideally, if uh, you didn't have waivers and all that, you'd just move the entire uh, Mangiapane, Jankowski, and Hathaway line into the NHL, not necessarily together, but because they're all playing really effectively and change things up that way, but... Unfortunately, well, the Flames have too many bodies, and the the management needs to sort this out soon. Where, like, I'm expecting Jankowski once Yager's healthy to go back down to the minors, just because that's the easiest way to do it. But they really need to get rid of some of the depth that they have that is not playing at an NHL caliber right now, whether that's waivers or trades, and either bring players up or have the actual good players playing. And yeah, I mean, guys who aren't playing well are going to be tough to get any value for in the trade market. Even future considerations and a handshake. See you later. That, that Can you would still be trade fine. for a bag of pucks? Probably. Or a boss that's been traded for in the in the past? Well, uh, the the Flames need to do something to sort a out A pre-release the iPhone six. ten. Yeah. <laughs> So, Matt, let's talk about that for a minute. So, when Yager went on the IR, the Flames opened up a spot on their roster and they brought Jankowski up to fill that spot. Some people expected it to be Mangiapane who got brought up because we were replacing then a winger with a winger, but instead we replaced a winger with a centerman and moved Bennett to the wing. So, now the question is, with Yager apparently pending return very shortly, what do we do now? I would say that Bennett has played his best hockey of the season as a winger, and I think that Jankowski has shown that he's NHL ready. So as you said, the easiest thing to do and what the team will probably end up doing is sending Janko back to the AHL. But and, I think there has and, to be a... Yeah, and they'd probably put Bennett back as a center. And that's... But then you're going back to what's not working. I know. And that's why something has to change where the team shakes things up organizationally to move some bodies out of the way so that way guys like Jankowski, Mangiapane, and Hathaway, who are all playing very well, can actually get an opportunity at the NHL level because uh, what's here just simply isn't working. So let me float an idea by you. We've talked in the past about sending Brower down, sending Stajan down, those sort of things. What if the Flames were to wave Curtis Lazar, send him to the AHL to take on Janko's spot to play first-line minutes, and try to get the laser back into Curtis Lazar's stick. Like, try to get him playing his best by making him the guy down there. I don't think Lazar's going to get taken. There's been better players who've cleared waivers this year. And that way, Janko can stay in the NHL. Uh, 
honestly, I think Lazar of all of the bottom six players, other than Sam Bennett, has played the best. I like Lazar. I think he's doing great, but I just I, don't yeah, I be- yeah, I wouldn't risk losing Lazar because he has played well enough of the bottom six. I like Lazar. I mean, you know that when we brought him in. But um, so what about the staging down? Honestly, any of the rest of the veteran guys could and should go. I think there's a chance we lose Versteeg, and as much as he might not be playing well now, I wouldn't want to lose him. No, me either. I, I'd He's be cheap more enough. You might lose him. Yeah, and realistically, with him, you'd if you're gonna bench him, you just bench him, not so. So wave I think him. Sta- so Stajan or Brower. Stajan, or- Stajan Hamilton and um glass glass i think would be the three m- most likely and probably in staging would probably be the best option to go see i think if i'm the gm just for what's easy they like staging here and staging has a lot of ties to the community i think it would be tough for him to go down i would wave glass if we yeah. lose him, we lose him. I really don't care. I didn't want Glass here in the first place. If we need a tough guy, we'll call up Gadzik or yeah, Hathaway. I agree. I agree. You and know, put, that would put be him. perfectly fine, too. I mean, even if we don't send him to the A because we've got tough guys, they're sent him to the ECHL. Let him, you know, patrol there. Whatever. Uh, it Just something needs to be done. Like, it, it's... There's to me, Glass many... is the odd man out. Yeah. You're not going to see Freddie sent down. I think Freddie's here because Dougie needs company. Yeah. You know, that's the thing when you sign a big deal, you can get your cheap brother on the team. And I think Freddie has a place. I think he's like he's a better version of Bartkowski on the forward side where, you know what, yeah, okay, we don't want him in the lineup every night, but I have yet to see Freddie screw things up. Yeah. He's your prototypical fourth line filler in guy. Like Mike Mark Smith from like eight, ten years ago or Lynn Loins. You know, going back 10, 12 years, like, you know, just random fill in guys that do the job effectively. Would you miss them if they're not here? I'm sure that half of our listeners don't even know who those players are. So, <laughs> you know, I think Freddie's a capable enough hand that you put him in for 10 games a year. He's fine. The rest of the time he can pick up Dougie's dry cleaning or whatever his job is. Yeah. Um. You know, but I, I, I just I wouldn't send him down. I don't think that fixes things. I think if you want to just make a spot, to me, Tanner Glass is the guy just taking up a roster spot who doesn't need to be here. Yep. So if we're not going to – I know what you're saying, and I like Lazar. I wouldn't necessarily send him down. I think he could benefit from being the guy, but if he keeps on his upward trajectory, keep him here. But, yeah, I think – the easy move is wave Glass. If he's taken, he's taken. Fine. And, uh, you know, leave – Leave Janko here, and that solves two problems to me. It keeps a centerman, and it keeps Bennett on the wing. I agree. And what do you think of Bennett on the wing? I think he's been playing his best hockey of the season. I think when he's not having to think the game like a centerman, and he can just react as a winger, I think that he's playing a lot better. Yeah, well, uh, there's a lot of defensive responsibility that comes with being a center. And, of course, the Flames were trying to make Bennett a... Backland clone, basically, a good two-way overall player. It's just that ba- Bennett was focusing too much on the defensive aspect, and he completely lost his offensive talents. And now that he's just able to do his offensive thing, he's starting to get more chances. And once he gets more comfortable with it, those pucks will start going in for him. It's just... Like anybody who's been off for like an injury or whatever, like you might as well consider Bennett's time as a center as being not playing his game. And so now he's playing his game again. He's just got to get his feeling back into things before. It's just like Yager in his first couple games. He wasn't very good, but then started contributing once things started getting going. I think Bennett can be an okay fill-in center if we need one. If we need somebody, you know, somebody's hurt and, um, you know, we need a center last minute, I think he's fine there. But I think his primary role should be as a left winger. I agree. 
So I'm I'm happy if they can keep him because if we move Bennett to the wing, I don't see who we put as a centerman. Lazar can play center, but I don't see Lazar as an upgrade at center right now if they send Janko back. No. Again, I think Lazar is better being sort of a left wing, right wing floater, if you will, who can play either wing. So, I mean, Freddie's not a centerman, so who else have we got? Nobody, which means, you know, Bennett will probably, by default, go back to center. So I think you need to keep Janko up for that reason. But Janko, I think, has played himself into a spot on the team. How about you, Matt? I agree. And uh, just like with Bennett, the points haven't come yet, but you know that they're going to. They are both of them are getting plenty of chances in each game. Once the puck actually goes in for them, I would expect a whole bunch to start going in for them. And I think if Bennett's on the wing when Yager returns, that's really going to help him too. Yeah, and I think having, especially as an educational asset, having Janko with Yager would be huge for Jankowski's development because. Jankowski is of a similar size as Yager, and he's always played a little timidly. So having Yager be able to instruct him on how to use his body properly would be a huge benefit for Yager, uh, Jankowski. What we're talking about it, last week's poll was, will Jankowski play well enough to stay in Calgary when Yager returns? And you guys had your say. Uh, the majority of people, 69%, said this is Jankowski's time to prove himself. His fate is in his own hands. 15% said, yes, Jankowski's the savior who will take the team to the playoffs. I'm not sure about that. Um, and 7.5% tied saying, no, this will be one of many short stints in Calgary or the Flames will banish him to Stockton as quickly as they can. So I think that we're all on the same page. Janko needs to be here. And I'm excited by the prospect of a bennett janko Yager line. Oh, so am I. Like, that could, if things work, you could have three really dynamite lines. It's just, will it work? And, you know, will they get the opportunity to see if it works? So, that, because, like, it, could you imagine if Gaudreau's line works with Furland, then you have the 3M line, which is usually fairly consistent, even though the offense hasn't been. And then Bennett with Janko and Yager, if they get going, like that could be a very dangerous lineup for the team. You know, even with that, I think you could construct a fourth line that could be a pretty good shutdown line. If you've got Versteeg, Brower, and I guess Stajan, I think that that line could still come around and be worth having. I'm not sure Stajan's the right centerman, but we're out of centerman. I mean, Glass isn't a centerman. Freddie's not a centerman. Well, you could put Lazar in there. Yeah, again, I don't know if I'd... Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those there. We'll see. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. You were mentioning uh, Furlan on the first line. There's some debate right now that when Yager comes back, do you put him on the first line with Goudreau Monaghan or do you let Michael Furlan stay on the first line? Your vote would be to have Furlan on the first line and move Yager down to the third line. Yes, and that's only just because of the fact that Furland seems to be coming around offensively. And it's interesting that one of the complaints that I had a handful of games ago was that uh, the coaching staff seemed to be reticent to allow the players to play their way and were trying to make the team more of a finesse team. And a prime example was Michael Furland. And it for the first handful of games like he was instructed not to hit and just be the look for the offense well so i tell mcgratton to go be a pure sniper yeah it, you're it's sort of like when uh bowmeister came here and brent sutter didn't play him in the manner that bowmeister played and then he struggled well it was obvious because bowmeister when he was with florida generated all of his offense by sneaking in from the point and especially on the power play and he'd be wide open for tap-ins and like he wasn't allowed to do that well similarly with furland he is a physical player and he plays better when he's engaged physically well against washington i think he had seven eight nine hits in the game and he scored a goal and 
ever since he's been utilizing his physicality again, he's performing. And the Flames coaching staff needs to utilize the players as they are, not how they want them to be, if that makes sense. And I think that leads into, like, Bennett using him as a center when he's a winger. And you just have to let Bennett do Bennett's thing. Yeah, I, I think maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but maybe what you're trying to say is the coaches had ideal roles in mind, and it's this is what we want from our first line right winger. So you're there, you play this way. Yeah, and or this is it, what we want from our third line center. So if you're going to be in that role, this is the way you're going to play. Instead of just saying this, is who the guy is, let him play his way. Yeah, and that's part of what made Hartley a good coach. Uh, in some aspects, was that he just let players play and that's why Bo Meester had his best season as a flame when Hartley was the coach mind you you can't just do things the way Hartley did where it was there was no real structure and everything just you know was a kind of a mess you can have a structured game but allow the players to do their own thing in the sandbox so to speak and if you're trying to control what they're doing in the sandbox things aren't going to work as effectively. Well, and this thing you and I have talked about way back in the day as well, which was, you know, when Sutter was coaching here, um, I think both Sutters, they had a system, and it was you had to mold to this system. And when Hartley was here, we had the opposite, which is there is no system, be whoever you want to be. And I think that we need to find the fine balance now. If here's the system, but find where you fit into this. Find, you know, where you are on the spectrum and how yeah. this applies to who you are as a player. And yeah. if you're Michael Furlan and you want to hit, well, that's fine. We have a place for you within the system. Here's how we're going to use you. Yeah, you be you while doing this. <laughs> and that's one of the things that Gullitson's coaching has been a little bit iffy on is that trying to restrict players a little too much. And, like, it you can't let anybody just do anything but it's finding that fine balance between having like a players all can do whatever they want coach like Hartley and having something too restrictive and right now we've been seeing a little too restrictive on the players since the start of the year but I think we're also seeing that loosening up yeah oh for sure to me, the big reason that I would not want Yager as the first line right winger, I think there's no doubt that Yager's out of here at the end of the year. And I think that we need to find some stability as a first line. And I think if Yager's injury prone, which I don't doubt that he is as an older guy, or if he's out of here at the end of the year, I don't want it to be, well, now we have to search for that winger again. So I would rather bring in a guy like Michael Furland and get that chemistry working really well so we know now that we have a top three in you know Furland, Monahan, and Goudreau, and yet let Yager sort of float around the middle. And I think that's really at this point in his career. As much as we all think of him as a superstar, still, I think at this point in his career, that's what he is. He's a you know middle six forward. Well, it's one of those things that if Furland struggles, you have a quality player that you can plug in. For sure, and, but I don't think he becomes that, your number one. No, and. It's one of those situations that will likely have to be resolved in the offseason where the Flames will have to go and trade some sort of asset to get a legitimate More right draft winger. picks. Yeah, or prospects, or, say, a left-wing player for a right-wing player. But that's something after this year, and or at the trade deadline, conversely, but that's more rental type situation but you know it's one of those things that whether you have Yager on the first line or the fourth line or in between I I still am not sold on Furland being a first line player no me neither but I think he has better chemistry with those guys than Yager does and I think they feel more comfortable with Furland there yeah we'll see it's all up in the air right now it, like as long as me, Yager can... buys us a year to figure out the right wing yeah I agree entirely, and that's why I was in favor of bringing him in in the first place, because, hey, we don't need to panic now that, you know, because, like, could you imagine if Yager wasn't on the team? How like right much... now, when, when we've seen a noticeable difference in the amount of the lineup? 
Yeah. Like, could you imagine how much we'd be, like, in panic mode of, oh, crap, all of our right-wingers are not doing well. Uh, what do we do now? <laughs> so, at least having him there helps, you know, gloss over things a bit. Yeah, I think that the Flames really have to start also looking internally for some of these answers. And I think that's going to be a big part of, you know, going forward, what they're going to have to look at is, yeah, we can go out and sign a guy, but we don't have a lot of assets to trade at this point. We don't want to give away a lot of our future. We've run out of draft picks to trade. So I think some of it's going to be, you know, can we bring in Mangiapane or somebody like that? Maybe not as number one guy, but can they be brought in and then moved up the lineup? Yeah, and that's one of the fun things that we'll have to look forward to as we head into the 2018-2019 season but we're only a dozen games in right now so a little bit more pressing matters to be concerned about than that <laughs> Matt I want to run something by you that I've been thinking about for last week I think when Johnny Goudreau came to this team um, we were looking at I think when Monahan was here we said Monahan's got a scoring touch but Monahan's really more of a playmaker and when Goudreau came in, at least for me and people I know, we said Goudreau's now the trigger man for Monaghan. Monaghan is essentially the centerman that we never had for Iggy, right? The trigger man, the guy who could set him up. But I think, especially this year and even late last year, I'm starting to notice that Goudreau's maybe not that pure sniper we once thought that he was or we hoped that he was. I'm not saying he's a bad player, but I think he's rounding himself out into being more of a, a well-rounded player. And I'm seeing him more as a playmaker. He's making a lot more passes. He's, you know, trying to set guys up a lot more. It's not just about put the puck on on uh, Johnny Stick and he'll put it on net. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I guess part of my question is if we look at a top line where we've got two playmakers and a tough guy, who now becomes that sniper? Is that Kachuk? Is, where do we get that scoring from? Well, that's the one thing that has irritated me about the rebuild is that the flames do not have any snipers in the organization and like furland is a quasi one because he has a good shot but that's part of the reason why i was hoping that uh back when the flames drafted kachuk that they would have gotten the pick to get lane instead but um just because, hey, here's a pure sniper, and, uh, you know, that would have been, like, the perfect option. But uh, the Flames need, basically, to find a modern Aginla. And, it, you know, the search for Aginla's center, well, we found it a little too late. To we found actually... Iggy's center, but now we don't have Iggy. Yeah, and now we need an Aginla type where... And it doesn't need to be anywhere near that caliber of player, but just somebody who is a, has a good shot. Like and see, it, I think uh, you could get away with a almost like a second line scorer with a pre with two premier playmakers like Monahan and Goudreau. I don't think Furlan's the right guy there, but I don't know that we need to go out and hire a you know top end elite sniper. I think we get away with almost a a second line sniper playing on that on that line. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I think we can almost get almost like a Yari Hoodler, who wasn't a top-line guy, but came here and became a top-line guy. Like, almost like somebody like a James Neal would, I think, be, like, the perfect option. Uh, but I don't see being able to get him for... I think Neal's going to be the most expensive free agent of the deadline this year. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking more, like, off-season than... At the deadline. Like, I'm sure that the Golden Knights are going to cash in uh, with him at the deadline. But, you know, that type of guy where he can put in 30 goals, even though he's only going to get, like, 50 points. And there are a handful of guys like that available around the NHL. It's just the Flames desperately need one of them. I well, think I mean, you've even talked in the past about a guy like a Justin Williams, who I think would work there too. Sort of a veteran guy who, you know, can be that trigger man for the other two. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be somebody extravagant to like a $7 million awesome all-star player. It's just anybody basically who can pick up from what Gaudreau and Monaghan are serving and throw it in the net. 
Yeah, I mean, looking around the league, I know he'd be expensive, but I'm even thinking a guy like a Patrick Hornquist. Well, actually, the Penguins are having depth issues right now, and yeah, he hasn't been having the best start, but that would be another good fit, especially on the power play. Just you know, I mean, he, he's getting and, paid like Brower. He's getting paid less than Brower now. I'm sure we could bring him in for, you know, $5 million if he has a bad year. But I think a goudreau Monahan line where those guys, either of them can score, either of them can set each other up, and bring Hornquist in just to be the trigger man. Yeah, you just need somebody to be able to – like uh, Monahan's goal yesterday against the Capitals – so somebody to be able to stand near the net and let Gaudreau fire the puck onto the stick. So, yeah. you know, any, anything like that, it doesn't really matter who that player is. It's just the Flames need someone. Well, I'm, I'm looking at potential free agents in 2018, so let me run through the top right wingers, and you tell me yes or no if you think you'd want them in that role. Joffrey Lupul. No, injured too much. Patrick Hornquist. If it's right, sure, why not? Bring in the other Stone and bring in Mark Stone. Didn't we can have uh, the Hamilton brothers and the Stone brothers? Hammer the Stone. Uh, there you go. You know, I think he's going to likely get like six and a half, seven million. so I don't know if we could afford that. What about Cam Atkinson out of Columbus? Too short. Joel Ward? Uh, too old. <laughs> Lee Stemniak, we can go back to the well. Sure, why not? <laughs> That'd be amusing. Um, no, I don't think so. I wonder if we could claim him off waivers again. Yeah. Um, or Jay Beagle. Uh, depth player. Yeah, I, I think of all those guys, you know, like I said, I think you could bring in a guy like Hornquist, who I don't think is a top-line right winger, but could be elevated that way playing with Goudreau Monaghan. But I think that's really, to me, the change I'm seeing in Goudreau is he's not that – pure score I think we all thought he would be and there's nothing wrong with that I think that's good that his game is evolving but yeah we need that guy I think just to be the trigger on that line yeah and Goudreau is a very high end playmaker and one of the top five or so in the NHL it's ideal situation is that you'd have somebody of an equal or nearly equal caliber that could fire home those pucks that he's serving up so hopefully the flames can at some point and like i wouldn't even be opposed to like a purely hockey trade like the ryan johansson for seth jones trade where the flames trade from an area of depth for a right winger that is like say i'm just going to use an example like say trading tj brody for a high-end right winger i wouldn't do that but you know what i mean like it's just i think something, you'd have better luck flipping hammock it, something along those lines where like a high-end player in another position or even like if sam bennett bounces back like even a sam bennett for a right winger you know what i mean like somebody thought of well uh, that you could swap out for where another team might need a center or a left winger or a defenseman. I think, and I think Bennett would be the more tradable asset looking at that contract. Yeah. So it's one of those where I think the Flames might end up having to do a hockey deal to get it done because I don't think those free agents are very good, but we'll see. There's They have to do something, and what that is, who the heck knows right at this point. I don't want to be too pie in the sky, but I think that we might see... I think Pittsburgh's going to get themselves in some trouble here mid-season, where I think they're going to have to make some moves just to shake up their team. So I think there might be a hockey... Like I don't think that we're going to get Hornquist at a reasonable price as a free agent, but I think if you can bring him in somehow through a hockey deal mid-season, you might be able to sort of get a discount on him next year because he likes being here. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I mean, he's making four and a half now, unless he has a terrible season and that whole team has a terrible season. I think he's going to be too rich for our blood next year. Yeah. And plus the Flames can also look internationally for whomever is doing well and send your scouts to the Olympics. Yeah. See if there's any Russians that might want to come over or whatever, you know, see if you can't find a Panarin and go from there. 
Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a Russian, but just some international player that is doing well. Are there any hot South Koreans this year? I have no idea. I know there's a certain number 12 that will likely be going there. Maybe, yeah, but you know, finding the center for Aginla, maybe we need to find the Aginla for Monaghan by getting Aginla. But see, <laughs> I, I, if Iggy doesn't play in the NHL all year and next year Iggy comes in, again, it just seems like another Band-Aid. It's like old guy to old guy. Okay, Yager's out. He's retired. Uh, Iggy, you're next in line. Come on down. Like, I think if we have to bring Iggy in next year, again, it shows that there's been some mismanagement of this team. Well, there's nothing wrong with Band-Aid players as long as you're addressing the core need, which is the right winger. And Yeah, I just think that you could pull a guy up from the A and have be more successful next year. I just, Especially after not playing in the league for a year, I don't know how successful Iggy would be next year. But we will we'll we'll see what they do. I'm I think that this right wing thing is going to be addressed by the deadline. Whether it's a trade, whether it's an AHL call up, how about you, matter? Do you think it takes till the off season to get done? Oh, well, I think that ideally the Flames would get another player in at the deadline. Whether that's say signing again after the Olympics or trading for whomever is a decent middle six right winger and go from there and then spend like the legitimate assets at during the off season, whether that's a free agent or otherwise to get the proper player. There's so many teams struggling right now as well that I can see maybe the flames can go shopping a little bit just because somebody's trying to shake up their roster. And it's like you said, it's a hockey deal. It's the player is not playing well here for players, maybe not playing well somewhere else, you know, a centerman for a winger, something like that. I don't think we're going to necessarily bring in a top line right winger, but I think we can definitely shore up that position. I think with Yager being, I would say an unknown commodity. We don't know if he's going to be hurt more or not. Um, I think we might need to do that. Well, the Flames could always uh, bring in Jetan Haas from the Swedish or Swiss League and make him a first-line right winger. You know, I think if we're looking overseas right now, I'd rather bring a guy like Mangiapani up and see what he's got. True. I don't think right now, if I think if we can trade an asset for an asset, great, because we're we have too many assets as it is. But I think if we're looking externally right now, especially mid-season. I think I'd rather just make a call up for one of our hot guys in the A or Hathaway or somebody who's playing well down there, even give Poirier a shot. I don't think they're going to be your top line guy, but I think they might be able to push some guys up the depth chart. Yeah. And um, speaking of which, there are some rumors that the Flames are interested in Jatan Haas, who plays for um, SC Bern in the Swiss League who has 17 points in 17 games there and is a right winger coincidentally. We've yeah. had we've had such mixed results with international players over the last little bit. Like David Wolf was a bust, um Chervanka was a bust, but then Riddich was good. So, I don't know, anytime I hear that we want to bring a guy over, Preble's not doing too bad. Anytime I hear that we want to bring a guy over, I'm always going, ah, "I don't want to I don't want to think that any guy who comes over like that is immediately going to be a top 6 player." Oh, I know. Who is the last European free agent the Flames brought over that did anything at the NHL level? I honestly couldn't Makarov? No, we drafted him, so. So I don't know. Like you know, yeah, I just it's been a while. We do we do good jobs with North American free agents. Oh yeah. It's just yeah. Gotta get some better European scouts. Jeez. Get to work, guys. Maybe they send you over there, Matt. Oh god. <laughs> Um, let's talk about what we were just talking about with the right wing. So when Yager returns, who do you guys think should play on the right wing on the first line? That's our poll for the week. Do you think it should be Yermer Yager taking the right wing spot? Do you think we should keep Michael Furland up there? We've also tried Curtis Lazar on the right wing spot this season. Maybe you think that he's the right guy or somebody else on the team. Um, maybe you think they should put Troy Brower up there or try Matt Stage in the right wing. You be the boss. You tell us who you think. You can answer the poll on firesidechat.ca. It's on the homepage. You can go on Twitter 
uh, we are tw- we are at Fireside Podcast on Twitter or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. And any of those places, we'll have the poll posted. And we want to know who you would put on the right wing when Yager returns. Matt, I think uh, that's about it for the week that was for the Flames. Shall we look ahead? Sure. Flames have two more games before we'll probably talk next. Two games at the Saddle Dome as they take on their longest homestand of the year with a seven-game homestand. The next game is on Thursday. The Flames will host the Pittsburgh Penguins, and then they have two days off, and Sunday they have the New Jersey Devils coming to town. So two games. Um, I'll I'll start this week. I think the Flames are going to struggle a little bit with Pittsburgh, even though Pittsburgh is struggling. I think that the Flames are struggling as well, and I think that we can win, but I don't see it being a big win. And I'm expecting the Flames to get a two or three goal win over the New Jersey Devils. I'm going to go with more optimistic and say four points for Calgary. You think so? Yeah. I think that Pittsburgh. I think they'll get four points, but I just think that they're going to struggle against Pittsburgh. Yeah. Pittsburgh's having some depth issues and goaltending issues, and I don't see that really resolving itself. Like when you give up seven goals to Winnipeg, you know you're hitting rock bottom. Um,. And New Jersey's been a lot better, and that's due in large part to the kid they drafted and Taylor Hall, of all people, uh, who's actually looking like an NHL caliber player now instead of, you know, being a one-way defensive train wreck. So, um, and also credit to Jordan Eberle for being, uh, if he was still an oiler, would be leading the team in scoring. While but, we're talking yeah. about train wrecks, uh, Pittsburgh waived their goaltender, Antti Niemi, and your second favorite team, the Florida Panthers, picked him up. What do you think of that move? Honestly, I think that if you ran the Florida Panthers by Twitter poll, I think it might actually be an improvement from what they're doing. But, yeah, it's not so good in Florida land. Artificial intelligence is the hot thing. Maybe they just fire their GM and let, you know, that computer that played on Jeopardy, Watson, maybe let that thing run the team. Yeah. Or just have an Xbox and simulate it on NHL 2K18 to see what you should be doing. Yeah, perhaps. It's one of those things that uh, the two teams, interestingly, that fully embraced advanced statistics were Florida and the Phoenix Coyotes. And who are the two worst, two of the worst teams in the league? Florida and the Arizona Coyotes. And it's one of those things where you wonder, gee, maybe the advanced statistics might not be complete. And that you shouldn't give everything on that one yet. But I think the Pittsburgh game is going to be a turning point for one of the two teams. I think it's either going to be Calgary wins against the... Washington Capitals and the Pittsburgh Penguins, and now that turns things around for them, or Pittsburgh's going to get a big win over Calgary, and that's going to turn things around for them? Well, I do believe the Penguins play the Oilers the night before, so hopefully they get their uh, you know, pre-Calgary thumping of the Oilers out of the way and feeling all good about themselves and come in a little unprepared for Calgary. Or we get a hot backup goaltender and, you know, things happen the way they have been lately. Yeah. Well, the the goalie I, I, for Pittsburgh, the backup yesterday, gave up his first goal on his first shot. So, Who know. is the backup now? Now that Niemi's the gone. Smith, Jacob the Smith, oh, I wow. think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So I can almost see if you're Pittsburgh saving Murray for the Calgary game. Yeah. Well, uh, then you could have the goalie matchup of Smith the Smith. Tristan Jerry is there. Uh, I think DeSmith is in Vegas. No, uh, DeSmith is was in that for Pittsburgh. Okay, their yeah. their website lists Tristan Jerry. So yeah, um, interesting. Well, yeah, there you go. DeSmith versus Smith. Yep. And then yeah, you're right. New Jersey is looking better. I still don't see New Jersey as a complete team though. No. I think that they've got some pieces, and I think if Calgary can play the way they did against. The Capitals, they're going to beat New Jersey. If they don't and they fall apart, I think New Jersey might be able to. And if they get into penalty trouble, I think New Jersey's got them. Oh, yeah. I agree. And then after that, they finish off the homestand against Vancouver, Detroit, and another game against St. Louis. So it'll be a fun couple weeks here leading up to Remembrance Day. Well, hopefully uh, next week we're 
talking about a couple of wins and then, hey, we can look forward to beating up on Vancouver and Detroit and, you know, get the ball really rolling forward instead of, you know, waffling. The game I'm really looking forward to is Saturday the 18th at Philadelphia. We get to score a ton of goals on Brian Elliott. Oh, yeah, that'd be fun. I don't care how the game ends. I just want the Flames to put a ton of rubber on Elliott. Yeah. Final I would score, love it if we can get 17, a 17-14. Shi- <laughs> well, I I would love it if Smith can get a get nothing in his net if he can get a shutout. And we just put a ton of goals past Elliot. Something tells me that you haven't quite forgiven him for his playoff performance. I don't well, know. Just, it just, you know, it wasn't one of just those a things. playoff performance. I mean, he just wasn't good all year. I know. Anyway, Where's Chad Johnson this year? Buffalo, back up. Oh, okay. So he did end up getting a backup job, which he didn't want. Yeah. And then uh, it's interesting because if you look, we play the Capitals again next month already. So we're going to get both of our games against them out of our system. It's almost like November is a mirror month. We play Dallas again, St. Louis again, Washington again. It's uh, it's interesting the way they've laid this this season out. Yeah. But Matt, you enjoy your Halloween in the first part of November. I can't believe it's almost November already, and we will talk to you after the New Jersey game. Go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.